Lenin, Karl Marx, Section, Socialism. From the foregoing, it is evident that Marx deduces the inevitability of the transformation of capitalist society into socialist society, and wholly and exclusively from the economic law of the development of contemporary society. The socialization of labor, which is advancing ever more rapidly in thousands of forms, and has manifested itself very strikingly, during the half-century since the death of Marx, and the growth of large-scale production, capitalist cartels, syndicates, and trusts, as well as in the gigantic increase in the dimensions and power of finance capital, provides the principal material foundation for the inevitable advent of socialism. The intellectual and moral motive force, and the physical executor of this transformation, is the proletariat, which has been trained by capitalism itself. The proletariat's struggle against the bourgeoisie, which finds expression in a variety of forms, ever richer in content, inevitably becomes a political struggle directed towards the conquest of political power by the proletariat. Quote, the dictatorship of the proletariat. The socialization of production cannot but lead to the means of production becoming the property of society, to the, quote, expropriation of the expropriators. A tremendous rise in labor productivity, a shorter working day, and the replacement of the remnants, the ruins, of small-scale, primitive, and disunited production by collective and improved labor. Such are the direct consequences of this transformation. Capitalism breaks for all time the ties between agriculture and industry, but at the same time, through its highest development, it prepares new elements of those ties a union between industry and agriculture based on the conscious application of science and the concentration of collective labor, and on a redistribution of the human population, thus putting an end both to rural backwardness, isolation, and barbarism, and to the unnatural concentration of vast masses of people in cities. A new form of family, new conditions in the status of women and in the upbringing of the younger generation, are prepared by the highest forms of present-day capitalism. The labor of women and children and the breakup of the patriarchal family by capitalism inevitably assume the most terrible, disastrous, and repulsive forms in modern society. Nevertheless, beginning of long quote, Modern industry, by assigning as it does an important part in the socially organized process of production, outside the domestic sphere, to women, to young persons, and to children of both sexes, creates a new economic foundation for a higher form of the family and of the relations between the sexes. It is, of course, just as absurd to hold the Teutonic Christian form of the family to be absolute and final as it would be to apply that character to the ancient Roman, the ancient Greek, or the Eastern forms, which, moreover, taken together, form a series in historic development. Moreover, it is obvious that the fact of the collective working group being composed of individuals of both sexes and all ages must necessarily, under suitable conditions, become a source of human development, although in its spontaneously developed, brutal, capitalistic form, where the laborer exists for the process of production, and not the process of production for the laborer. That fact is a pestiferous source of corruption and slavery. End quote from Capital, Volume 1. The factory system contains, quote, the germ of the education of the future, an education that will, in the ease of every child over a given age, combine productive labor with instruction in gymnastics, not only as one of the methods of adding to the efficiency of social production, but as the only method of producing fully developed human beings. End quote. Marx's socialism places the problems of nationality and of the state on the same historical footing, not only in the sense of explaining the past, but also in the sense of a bold forecast of the future, and a bold practical action for its achievement. Nations are an inevitable product, an inevitable form, in the bourgeois epoch of social development. The working class could not grow strong, become mature, and take shape without, quote, 
constituting itself within the nation, without being national, though not in the bourgeois sense of the word. The development of capitalism, however, breaks down national barriers more and more, does away with national seclusion, and substitutes class antagonisms for national antagonism. It is, therefore, perfectly true of the developed capitalist countries that, quote, the working men have no country, and that, quote, united action by the workers, of the civilized countries at least, quote, is one of the first conditions for the emancipation of the proletariat, end quote. That state, which is organized coercion, inevitably came into being at a definite stage in the development of society, when the latter had split into irreconcilable classes, and could not exist without an authority, ostensibly standing above society, and to a certain degree separate from society. Arising out of class contradictions, the state becomes, quote, the state of the most powerful, economically dominant class, which, through the medium of the state, becomes also the politically dominant class, and thus acquires a new means of holding down and exploiting the oppressed class. Thus, the state of antiquity was above all the state of the slave owners for the purpose of holding down the slaves, as the feudal state was the organ of the nobility for holding down the peasant serfs and bondsmen, and the modern representative state is an instrument of exploitation of wage labor by capital. End quote from Engels, The Origin of the Family, Private Property, and the State, a work in which the writer expounds his own views and Marx's. Even the Democratic Republic, the freest and most progressive form of the bourgeois state, does not eliminate this fact in any way, but merely modifies its form, the link between government and the stock exchange, the corruption, direct and indirect, of officialdom in the press, etc., by leading to the abolition of classes, socialism will thereby lead to the abolition of the state as well. The first act, Engels writes in Antiduro, quote, by virtue of which the state really constitutes itself the representative of society as a whole, the taking of the means of production in the name of society, is at the same time its last independent act as a state. The state interference in social relations becomes superfluous in one sphere after another, and then ceases of itself. The government of persons is replaced by the administration of things, and by the direction of the processes of production. The state is not abolished, it withers away. End quote. Quote, the society that will organize production on the basis of a free and equal association of the producers will put the whole machinery of state where it will then belong, into the Museum of Antiquities, by the side of the spinning wheel and the bronze axe. End quote from Engels, The Origin of the Family, Private Property, and the State. Finally, as regards the attitude of Marxist socialism towards the small peasantry, which will continue to exist in the period of the expropriation of the expropriators, we must refer to a declaration made by Engels, which expresses Marx's views. Quote, when we are in possession of state power, we shall not even think of forcibly expropriating the small peasants, regardless of whether with or without compensation, as we shall have to do so in the case of the big landowners. Our task relative to the small peasants consists, in the first place, in effecting a transition of his private enterprise and private possession to cooperative ones, not forcibly, but by dint of example, in the proffer of social assistance for this purpose. And then, of course, we shall have ample means of showing to the small peasant prospective advantages that must be obvious to him even today. End quote and end of section.